Um, so welcome to the next session where we want to focus on the industry perspective on drug development in rare tumours um, such as cardiac sarcomas and how we can improve collaboration between uh, pharma companies and academic investigators. And having said that, it's a, um, really a great pleasure to introduce a fantastic colleague and collaborator, as well as a good friend, Charles, Dr. Charles Thayer, um, CEO of Tracon Pharmaceuticals. And um, Charles will discuss the potential role of new therapeutics in angiosarcoma of the heart from the perspective of checkpoint inhibition. So over to you, Charles, and thank you. Again, uh, thanks for the privilege of, of speaking with you. And what I thought I'd do today is, is kind of give a perspective, starting really big picture down in terms of, I think, what kind of retards the ability of big pharma to invest heavily in rare tumors and why at Tracon we're really focused on rare tumors, especially sarcoma related to, to kind of the way we, we do our drug development. So I thought I'd just start with kind of what some of the barriers are to drug development, especially from a big pharma perspective, and, and then talk about our approach, really focus on our experience in sarcoma, and then especially dial down to our current focus on immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy for, for sarcoma. So kind of starting at, at a large kind of top level view, you know, there are really three reasons I think that many big pharma companies are, are really reluctant to invest in, in rare tumor types, including sarcoma, including cardiac sarcoma. And they kind of fall into three broad categories. There's the cost, there's the time, and then there's the risk. And the cost of clinical trials, as I'll discuss, has really become prohibitive, uh, especially with respect to the return on investment that pharma companies demand to invest capital into drug development, the majority of which, as you'll see, is to conduct clinical trials. And given that cost and the demand for return on investment, a lot of companies are forced, if you will, pharma companies are forced to focus on the larger indications because that's where they can actually generate the revenue that justifies the developmental cost. You know, the other thing that really drives return on investment is time, that the longer it takes to develop a drug, the longer it takes to approve a drug, clearly the cost of capital goes up dramatically, and that affects the ability of the company to have a return on their investment. And I'll emphasize through the presentation that it's so important for accelerated approval as a, as a method to approve drugs in a timely fashion that really helps companies focus on rare tumors. And then the final thing is the risk of drug development is so high. I mean, unfortunately, most drugs fail and the majority of drugs fail. And, and because of that, the cost of approving a single drug is actually incredibly high, as I'll just detail. And again, that sometimes focuses big pharma on just the big indications, unless you can drive the cost down of development and decrease the timelines. And as I'll emphasize in the presentation, that's kind of one of our key focuses at, at Tracon. But just to give you an idea of, of, of how much capital has to be invested to approve a single drug, this is data from, from Joe DeMasi at the, the Tufts Center for Drug Development, which is really, I think, the seminal work that really shows, you know, it costs $2 billion for each new drug that's approved. Actually, more like $2.5 billion, and that was 10 year, almost 10 years, sorry, six years ago. If you look at just the out-of-pocket costs, you can see it's, it's $1.4 billion. And the majority of that is spent on clinical trials. And it's, it's important to understand, you know, this is all costs of all development to approve a single drug. Now, like most drugs fail. So this is not the cost to approve a single drug, but the total cost that is spent by pharma with one approval, the end result of that to total investment. So it's an incredible amount of cost and the majority is spent doing clinical trials. And if there's one area we could improve in terms of focusing on rare tumors would be driving this cost down. You know, the other issue is time, as I mentioned. You know, in general, it takes you know, about eight years to approve a single drug. That may actually be longer in oncology where you need three trials, meaning phase one, phase two, phase three. But if we can drive that time down, and mainly the way to do that would be accelerated approval based on phase two data, which again is something that's that's well understood. You know, that makes a huge difference in the ability of pharma companies to invest in rare tumors. 
as I mentioned, the big issue is, is the relative risk of development. And unfortunately, oncology is the riskiest developmental area across the board. This is a, a graphic looking at different therapeutic areas. You can see hematology is relatively low risk. You know, three out of four drugs fail, but that means one out of four is approved. Unfortunately, in oncology, it's more like one out of 19, excuse me, one out of 20 drugs uh, actually succeed and 19 out of 20 fail. So clearly when you have that type of, of, of probability of success, you know, the amount of money invested in most drugs that fail contributes to the high cost for each drug that's actually approved. So, so given those dynamics, um, we actually at Tracon, as, as I think many of you know, really are focused on, on trying to eliminate or, or reduce the cost of clinical trials. And we've become convinced that, that clinical CROs are actually destroying value in the pharma sector and actually prevent companies from going into rare tumors. And it's unfortunate, but there are two parties that are really being hurt by CROs. It's not just the sponsors, it's actually the sites. And I'll get into that in a little more detail. But a CRO engages in a, in a game almost of what was called bid to win, manage to profit. So they'll bid a price to a, 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 a drug company to do a trial. They know that's not the actual price that will take to actually conduct the study. study. And they manage to profit because they're paid in an egregious fashion. They're paid fee for service, and then they get a monthly fee for the duration of the trial. They call it project management fee. Now, I've always thought that was completely ridiculous. And I've always thought the CRO should be paid the same way a site is paid. As a site, you're paid when you enroll a patient. That's not how a CRO is paid. They get paid when a patient's enrolled and they can generate all the services to monitor the patient. But even if not a single patient is enrolled, they get paid a monthly fee. And it's not a low fee. It's a high fee. Why don't sites get that? Well, in my view, everyone should be aligned. So in our view, if the site gets paid based on accrual, so should the CRO. But that's not how it works. And the result is, if, if the CRO makes the bid price, for every $6 a sponsor pays, five goes to the CRO and one goes to the site. And if the CRO is poor and takes longer to do the trial than expected, which they always do, it's more like 10 to 1. And that, in my view, is killing our business in terms of the ability to focus on rare tumors because it becomes so expensive when companies use CROs. And unfortunately, in this era, almost every pharma company uses a CRO. And that's the problem. Well, I think as, as many of the investigators on this call know is we don't do it that way. We do our own trials with our own team. We've been doing it for 10 years and we won't make a profit on ourselves. So we can do trials at incredibly low cost. And because we do, can do trials at low cost, our return on investment calculation can address rare tumors and still be a profitable way to do drug development because our costs are so low. And I, we're actually trying to help other companies do the same thing, teach them our systems, because if we all did it the Tracon way, literally we developed three drugs for the price of every one. So I, I point this out just to kind of set the table for why you don't see as many pharma companies going to rare diseases as you should. And, and this is a, a net present value analysis that I, I think is so illustrative. This is, this is a drug modeled here that has a billion dollars in peak sales for over 10 years. It's a blockbuster drug with a typical 70% gross profit margin, a 15% cost of capital, the typical 5% probability of success. And we're modeling two things here. One is if the drug development takes 10 years, requires say three segments of development, phase one, phase two, phase three, versus just phase one and phase two, but also as importantly is what if we could decrease the clinical trial cost by just 25%. And you can see the difference here that if you can develop drugs at a lower cost and more quickly turns a negative NPV to positive. But I think what's even more important here is, is just the fact that even a blockbuster product has a negative net present value, meaning it wouldn't even justify investment, even though it's going to be a blockbuster product for 10 years. And again, that points out the inefficiency of drug development is really hurting the ability of companies to develop drugs, even for common diseases, not to mention rare diseases. The other, I think, critical aspect of that graphic is that accelerated approval is so critical to the development of drugs for rare diseases. You know, I, I point out here that, you know, if you can develop drugs more efficiently, you know, just based on phase one and phase two data where the trials only take, say, five years to do, you can clearly 
generate an NPV that's positive, even for a rare disease. And even if you're using a CRO, for instance, that typically takes longer to do trials, even there, accelerated approval may be able to generate positive NPV for a rare disease. But either way, accelerated approval is absolutely critical for companies that consider development of rare diseases. And I, I point that out because there's been a lot of discussion about accelerated approval, and I completely agree that you need to do the post-approval commitment study and have it underway at the time of the application. But accelerated approval is so important to companies like Tracon or others that focus on rare tumor types. So this is just kind of a tale of the tape that if you can literally do trials at a third the cost of a CRO, Here's a 190 patient trial modeled with a CRO independent process, such as we use at Tracon, versus a CRO. And that's, that's the tail of the tape. You can do it for a third the cost. And also, because you're doing your own trials with your own team, unlike a CRO who gets paid more the longer a trial takes, at Tracon, we're incentivized to actually do the trial quickly. So you can cut time and also money. And like we talked about earlier, that makes all the difference in being able to actually generate a return on investment, even in a rare tumor. And so this is really why we are able to focus on rare tumors is because we do our own trials with our own team. And that makes all the difference. So that said, I, I hope that you find that kind of interesting. I, I just thought I'd start kind of high level about why we do what we do and why we can do what we do. And then I just focus on a couple of our trials in sarcoma and, and where we've, we've gone and what we've done and, and the results of those trials. And as many of the investigators on, on this call know, you know, we did focus initially on angiosarcoma. Uh, we did a study called TAPAS, which was a combination study, was pizofenib with or without our drug TRC-105, which was an antibody to an angiogenic target called endoglin. And we accrued this very rapidly. Um, we accrued 130 patients actually in about two years and actually, uh, Bernard and, and Robin were the two lead accruers, and, and we were incredibly happy with the pace of accrual. And I think we showed that, you know, in a rare tumor, you can accrue. Uh, we had did this study at about 30 sites in the U.S. We did it at five European countries, and we were highly motivated to do so with our team. And, you know, we collected an incredible amount of, of tumor specimens that we now have, have, have supplied to, to investigators to do ancillary studies. Um, and unfortunately, the trial was not successful. Uh, as noted on the next slide, and this is a publication uh, that Robin uh, and Vinod were the two lead authors on that, you know, showed at the interim analysis, you know, we, we still think we saw some effect in certain patients, but overall, there was not a significant treatment effect in the DMC recommended termination of the trial. Unfortunately, we really never were able to identify if what factors may have predicted individual activity uh, but that is something potentially could be reviewed in the future. But again, the, the bottom line on this trial was you can accrue rare tumor types in sarcoma with motivated investigators, motivated sponsor, and, and a motivated team. Uh, and, that, and that, I thought, was, was a great success story for us, although our drug, unfortunately, was not effective for these patients. The other great thing about this study for us is we really understood an unmet need that in sarcoma for a checkpoint inhibitor. And I'll kind of tell the story about how this all happened with respect to our, our, our interest in checkpoint inhibitors in sarcoma. And it really happened at ASCO 2019. Uh, I was at the poster, that uh, the SARC-28 poster, and Melissa Burgess was presenting the poster. And we saw that beautiful response rate I'll show you in a second. And I said, that's fantastic news. I said, when does the pivotal trial start? And she said, well, not only is there no pivotal trial, we're not even able to secure continued funding to continue rolling in the current trial. And I, I just couldn't believe that statement. And based on that statement, that day, we looked for a checkpoint inhibitor to meet the unmet need in refractory UPS that was detailed as potentially a single agent active, active drug that could meet the unmet need in refractory sarcoma. Uh, and we went to China to do it. Um, we knew in China there were a lot of checkpoint inhibitors available. Uh, we knew that uh, we could license one, and we made the commitment to fulfill the unmet need identified in SARC-28 that was not going to be met by Big Pharma. 
Uh, after that, we saw further data ask with 2020 that dual checkpoint inhibition could further increase that response rate in UPS. And I'll talk about that in terms of how we incorporate that into our study design. Uh, we ended up licensing uh, a drug that actually had shown some activity as expected in ASPS, uh, which helped us uh, corroborate that uh, the drug was as active, for instance, as atezolizumab, which is now approved in refractory ASPS. But really what we wanted to do was meet an unmet need that no other company really was, would, would, was willing to address. This is the SAR-28 data. I mean, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir with respect to, to these data, um, but this is really the, the data that we said is the basis for us taking the effort to license a pdl one antibody to meet an unmet need in an indication where the only approved therapy, pizopinib, in refractory disease has a 4% response rate. So seeing 23%, you know, in our view was, was incredible. You know, I do think the 23% may be a little higher than you, you might be the true response rate. I say that because if you recall the SARC-28 study, the first four of 10 patients responded and then thereafter it was, it was five out of 30. So I think the five out of 30 probably is the true response rate, but a 15% response rate in refractory sarcoma, UPS, in our view is, 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 is remarkable and worth repeating a study to demonstrate that response rate as the basis for accelerated approval. I mentioned also the alliance data that further showed that if you combine two checkpoints, in this case, Nevo and Ipi, granted small sample size, but you could potentially increase that response rate even further, and in this case, to 29%. So based on these real two key data points, we licensed a checkpoint inhibitor and worked to develop it in UPS, knowing that UPS is, is a relatively common sarcoma, knowing it's in very underserved in terms of available therapies. You know, Doxorubus in the standard frontline therapy response rate, probably less than 17%, but that's kind of the overall response rate. I'm using this control arm from the uh, from Bill Tapp's study as the 70% across most sarcomas, including potentially UPS, although it may be lower actually in UPS. And then the fact that the only approved agent for refractory disease, bisopinib, has a 4% response rate. Again, that may even be lower in UPS than, than the overall 4% response rate in the pallet study. It has a black box warning for fatal liver toxicity. So clearly the unmet need was there, clearly was not being addressed, and, and we, we wanted to, to take this on. So clearly there's an unmet need, and then how would we meet the need? And, and we looked at several checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, we could have licensed kind of a PD-1 Pembro lookalike, but we also thought that what really would get us excited and, and patients and physicians excited is we could potentially not just address the unmet need with a checkpoint here, but do it with a best in class. Felt that would be do two things. It would address the unmet need, but also do it with the potentially best in class product for sarcoma patients that would be even potentially a better product than what's approved for non-sarcoma patients. And this is the antibody called enbifolumab. Uh, what makes it unique is it's a, a single domain antibody. So it's, it's an FV with a CH2, CH2, or FC backbone. But because it's 80 kilodaltons versus a standard antibody of 140, you can give it subcutaneously without even an adjuvant, and it's rapidly absorbed in the bloodstream and then disseminates to the tumor. And so that's what makes endofolumab special is its unique, if you will, single domain antibody design, which is a, a pioneering technology that was initially developed at Ablinks, now a Sanofi company, and is the basis of one approved product uh, for TTP, but also being developed as a more common platform, given how easy it is to administer sub-Q. And it is really easy to administer. This is a picture of a, a patient being given a dose on the skin overlying the triceps muscle. It's a 30 second, less than two cc injection. And the other advantage is there's no infusion reaction risk. So patients can be dosed and, and literally go home and be dosed in the clinic with the potential for self-administration as, as, as we move the product through development. We also had a lot of experience with enrofolumab through our partners that had been dosed and now to over a thousand patients. It was shortly after our license approved in China for MSI high cancer patients. And it had been dosed fortunately in a phase one study in the US. And based on the totality of these data, including the phase one data, 
we were able to push forward directly into a pivotal study as soon as we licensed the program and discussed our plans with the FDA. Uh, just a little more background on the compound. We had seen, as I mentioned, activity in ASPS even in phase one against small number of patients, but two of five patients responded, which was on par with the response rate had been noted for atezolizumab in the same population. You know, the PK is such that you give a sub Q, it's absorbed with a rapid, uh, with a P concentration at day three or four, but then the terminal half life is, is over three weeks, similar to an antibody because it has that FC, FC region. The other thing we were impressed with is that the drug was on the verge of being approved in China in MSI high cancer. And in that patient population, it had a very high response rate, nearly 45%, but that was all comers and an impressive duration response of 12 months of 90%. When you actually dial down into a population that you could compare across trials, meaning the Envifolumab pivotal study, the Nevo pivotal study, and the Pembroke pivotal study, and here restricting patients with MSI high colorectal cancer who progress following treatment with the three approved chemotherapies for their disease, we were impressed the response rate of the three trials was nearly identical and also impressed the duration response for ENVO was quite impressive, not just at six months, but at 12 months. So we felt we had a checkpoint inhibitor that was as efficacious as the reference products, Nevo and Pembro, had a better side effect profile because of the lack of infusion reactions and was also very convenient to give to patients. Next, we were thinking, how can we get the drug approved? And, and I mentioned, I think the true response rate in refractory UPS for checkpoints is probably about 15%, but I think that's enough to get a drug approved, especially when standard of care has a response rate of 4%, which is true with pizopinib. And we've clearly seen the FDA will approve checkpoint inhibitors on teen response rates uh, as long as the confirmatory trial is positive. Uh, they'll maintain that approval. And so based on these data, we approached the FDA with a trial designed to approve a checkpoint here and refer to UPS based on response rate. And this is the trial that we designed uh, with FDA input. And this is a trial ongoing now at about 29 sites in the US and also at, at uh, Royal Marston in the UK. We enroll patients with refractory UPS or MFS and enroll actually into one of two cohorts, but there actually is no control cohort in this study. The control cohort is pizopinib, or the control, de facto control is the historical response rate of pizopinib of 4%. And so we have to beat 4% with either one of these two cohorts, either single agent ENVA, where we expect about a 15% response rate, or ENVA plus IPI, where we expect the response rate could be higher. But if either of those cohorts meets the bar of beating 4%, that achieves the primary endpoint. And so in each of the 80 patient cohorts, we need nine of 80 responses in order to achieve an 11.25% response rate that would statistically exclude 5%, which thereby excludes the 4% response rate of, of pizopinib. And that's the primary endpoint with the key secondary endpoint being duration response, median duration response expected to be at least six months. And this study is enrolling currently, uh, as I mentioned, we're accruing quite nicely, uh, appreciate all the support from the community. And we were happy that uh, the initial futility analysis at 18 patients, which required just a single response in each cohort, we're happy to see we actually had double digit response rates in each cohort as of the first 18 patients in each cohort. And we have a second analysis, interim analysis expected mid this year, and that's at 46 patients in each cohort. And again, the total accrual is 80 patients in each cohort. This just kind of gives you an idea of, of, of how the study's going. Um, Focusing here, we had a couple of safety reviews. The combination and single agent cohorts have resulted in good tolerability. I mentioned we had a double digit response rate in each cohort at the first analysis and expect also to see that at the second analysis expected mid this year. And our goal is to file for approval based on the primary endpoint being obtained in mid 2024. Recently, we licensed our own CTLA-4 antibody called Y001 to emphasize our frontline development in sarcoma. I won't go through this in detail, but it looks a lot like ipilimumab, had a little bit better performance preclinically head-to-head, -head, but very similar to ipilimumab. It's, it's given IV every three weeks as if he would is given. And our goal here is to get to the end line here. So we're in the end of a SARC trial here. 
designed to approve MSR and refract UPS and MFS. Our goal is to get to the end line, which is to do a combination study in frontline sarcoma of docs with or without ENVA plus our CTLA-4 antibody white 001 But we'd like to enroll more patients here than just UPS and MFS. In order to inform as to which additional subtypes of, should come into that study, we just started a phase one, two trial of ENVA, the CTLA antibody 001 and DOCS that includes LMS and D-differential liposarcoma, for example. And based on response rates being superior to expected historical data, if we can achieve those response rates, those additional cohort or subtypes of sarcoma would then enroll in the post-approval commitment study in a, on top of UPS and MFS. And our goal would be to enroll maybe half of all sarcoma in this trial for potential full approval. So in summary, the sarcoma represents one of the highest unmet needs and, and we are really proud to be emphasizing our company really has become a sarcoma company to emphasize the development of therapeutics for these patients and we do remain eager to work with with you and and, and develop other agents that you feel have merit and deserve development in sarcoma where other companies may not have the ability to develop it at the same cost and time structure we do uh, to emphasize uh, to, to generate a return on investor to make it worth while from a business perspective, but more importantly, to make it while from a patient perspective. But we really are committed, I think, as, as many of the investigators know, this we really care about moving forward the standard care in sarcoma. Um, why we can do it is, is more efficient clinical trial conduct. And, and that, in my view, is the biggest barrier to drug development for rare diseases at this time. Uh, accelerated approval, also absolutely critical. You know, a lot of people talk about orphan drug designation, and that's important because it gives you market exclusivity but it's more important to get the drug approved quickly. So accelerated approval is absolutely critical to our efforts. And I think as we're showing, you can develop drugs in rare sarcomas and it's economically feasible. And you can don't have to charge a premium price if you can do it efficiently. And that means save time and money because our plan is not to actually charge a premium for, for Envifolumab upon approval to price at the same price as other checkpoints and, and you can do it if you do drug development, again, quickly and at low cost. And again, the accelerated approval pathway is a critical part of that, that development. So, so with that, I appreciate your time and uh, much welcome questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Charles. That was uh, fantastic. And th there are a number of comments and we can just go through these um, very, very quickly. So I know Alby has made two comments, one regarding the um, uh, the interaction with pharma companies versus um, CROs, and the second regarding the choice of uh, pazopinib as a reference in the randomized trial. So um, I suppose, um, Albi, uh, your, your point regarding um, interaction with um, with uh, pharma companies and, and um, uh, crows, what, what's... Um, are there any sort of salient points that you want to, um, to make regarding that? Yeah, thank th thank you, Robin. Uh, I guess you know from from wearing my sarcoma and phase one hat, we always find dealing with CRO much more difficult because it adds the layer of complexity, it adds time and not as well as money, and um, and I'm not saying this for all CROs. Some CROs are very bad at paying us. And and it's almost done intentionally so that you know we we have to like repeated uh, have repeated um, uh, uh, follow ups mm -hmm. to to get paid. So you know and and time is money and we're not paid at all uh, mm -hmm. for this repeated request, right? So so it's added cost on our half manpower manpower time, and that's not accounted for. And in the hearts of hearts. I believe working with pharma directly is always much more intuitive. Yeah. That's definitely, you have, a, you have a kindred spirit here on that topic. Um, as I mentioned, the, the two people or groups that are dying because of zero inefficiencies are not just sponsors, but the sites. Um, it's absolutely egregious how, in my view, they have perturbed the drug development process to a, a pure, let's make as much profit as we can. And uh, they have no alignment to actually do trials quickly or to be efficient. The, 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 it's, it's the ultimate irony. The worst job they do, the more they get paid. 
it's it's like it's like a bad lawyer uh you know if, if you have a good lawyer you pay them a ton but at least they do their job quickly if you have a bad lawyer you pay them the same amount and three days later you still haven't gotten anything and they bill you three times as much it's 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 that irony it's it's terrible and but, 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 the but point I guess... Oh, carry on, Alex. Sorry, sorry. No, but I guess the, the, the question that I really have is that for smaller companies, that is easier said, right? Uh, easier done than, yeah. than, than in bigger companies where you have to scale up. So I, I, I don't know where, where the affliction point should be. Yeah. So, Ali, what we're, we're willing to do, so we, we are actually willing to help small companies. So, so, you know, we've been doing our own trials with our own team for 10 years, but actually we are really trying to help other companies break free what I call zero quicksand. The problem with these companies, they, they sign a zero contract, they're in quicksand, they can't get out. It's like, they, so we try to, we're actually willing to do trials with companies, replace the CRO but we will not get paid the way they do. We just think it's almost immoral. So we do pay for performance. The same way the sites get paid, we get paid. Patient enrolls, you pay us. Same way the site gets paid. That way everyone's aligned to the trial quickly and at a set cost. And that's how, in our view, the whole business should be run. So if you have companies that are about to step into that zero quicksand, please send me a note. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> We'd love to help them. <laughs> That's good to, uh, to know, Charles, and maybe we can carry on with this discussion um, after uh, Christy and Lee's um, presentation. But there were just um, two other questions. Um, as I say, um, Albie's question regarding the choice of pizopinib and whether to use PFS as an endpoint. And then Karen also had a question regarding what does a black box warning mean? Sure. Sorry. Sorry for that. So black box warning is, is a warning that is required by the FDA on the label for a drug that has a particularly dangerous and many times fatal side effect. Um, and, and for instance, Pazopin has a black box warning on the label that indicates that fatal liver toxicity is, is a known complication of the drug. You know, interestingly, most checkpoints, I don't think any checkpoint has a black box warning. So it just tells you there's a, a side effect profile discrepancy there. So when I say we, we want to replace pizopidum and UPS, we feel we can show greater efficacy, but also uh, superior safety as well. You know, the, the PFS question. So so our goal is to get accelerated approval. And, and the way to do that through the FDA really is response rate. You, you, you To have PFS as the endpoint, you need an active control. And we wanted to avoid an active control in Envisarc. So we use the 4% response rate. And beating that is the basis for our anticipated accelerated approval. But to your point, you know, when we do the post-approval confirmatory study, docs with or without IO therapy, in that case, PFS will be the endpoint and we will have an active control arm which you, you absolutely need for the FDA. So I think this is a critical point. The FDA will not approve any drug based on single arm time to event data. So you could have the longest PFS in the world or the longest OS in the world, but they won't let you use that even compared to historical data, at least they haven't in the past, but they will let you use response rate as compared to historical response rates as a tried and true way of approving through accelerated approval. 